with today's uh, There was um, a, a graph I showed on Monday, and uh, after, after the lecture, I thought, um, hmm. Um, and then when I projected it, I didn't remember um, why why I really wanted to show it to you. Um, and so afterwards, um, I thought maybe I'd come back to this slide to um, just if any any one of you was wondering um, if if there wasn't anything wrong with the slide, um, uh, so when so, so we we know there are two models, two basic models of uh, strain hardening. One model, um, which um, which has um, okay, the strain hardening has to do with. Uh, the tendency that dislocations will have to form cell structures very quickly um, in the def process of deformation. So you'll, you'll find, you'll form uh, uh, a non-uniform uh, distribution of dislocations and you'll have um, cell walls with lots of dislocations and then cell interiors with very little, this few dislocations, but that's where the dislocations are, um, are moving. Mm -hmm. That's where you find the mobile dislocations. So um, now that's an interesting model, and there are suggestions that that model is is uh, you know maybe valid. Huh? There there are theories, uh, and these uh, theories uh, show, for instance, and, uh, and, and are actually based on the fact that there is a direct relation between flow stress and the size of the. Uh, the inverse size of the dislocation cell size diameter. So the, the smaller the size, the larger the flow stress. And that's, that's basically what happens when you do, uh, you deform a material, a steel, the, you see the cell size becomes smaller and smaller, and the flow stress increases. Now, it, uh, despite the fact it's an interesting model, uh, nowadays um, we tend to prefer models which, which only use one parameter, which is, uh, and which ignores the cell formation, basically. And that, is, uh, and that parameter is just the dislocation density. Hmm. Um, having said this, you, that, particular model of, um, uh, that particular model can be made more complex, and, and you can actually introduce something that is similar to um, dislocation cell formation in, in that model. So, um, so don't get me wrong here. Um, that, that model of um, dislocation density, you can do a lot with it, actually. Um, right. And, but, so so th that model says, okay, so at the beginning, you don't have many dislocations. You have a very good annealed material. You start generating dislocations from, uh, so, so let's just look at the grain here, right? Hmm. So you can follow what I'm saying. And let's say it's iron, yes. And you know that um, when we uh, start making dislocations, we, we need to have sources of dislocations. Um, in BCC iron, that's very readily available. Uh, you have a dislocation. We'll have, um, we'll have, a, um, a, we'll, we'll have a jog, for instance. And uh, the jogs can can be uh, can generate dislocations, or you will have a process of um, double cross slip. Yes, double cross slip, and uh, that will uh, generate Frank loops. Yes, Frank uh, read. Excuse me, Frank read sources that uh, you know. That, so, so one little. Um, uh, 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 pair of jogs here due to cross slip, which is very simple in, in BCC iron because of the high stacking fault energy, and you generate very, very many dislocations. So at the beginning, uh, so let's, let's say here, this is a, one of these Frank Reed sources, and we generate lots of dislocations. There may be one here also. We generate lots of dislocations. We generate a lot of dislocations. So at the beginning, we get lots of 
mobile dislocations, right? Mm -hmm. um, and um, so in, this, uh, in the model of um, dislocation density evolution of strain hardening, um, gradually these, um, you get into a situation where the dislocations run into forest dislocations, yes? Mm -hmm. And so, so they get, um, and these forest dislocations works, uh, work as obstacles, right? So, so this dislocation will encounter dislocations where are, which, which cut its slip plane, yes? Uh, and where do they come from? Well, from other sources in your grain, right? And these will act as, right, as obstacles, yeah? Okay. Um, so what, what we have is we have production of mobile dislocations, and these mobile dislocations become immobilized, yes? They become immobile dislocations, yeah? Um, and, um, yeah, and, and in fact, you could say that, that these are actually the forest dislocations, yeah? because they don't move, they don't participate in the climate. So, um, the, if, if, if this is the strain, yes, yeah. and uh, let, me, let me draw, so you, you remember, I said that uh, when you strain a material, dislocation density um, increases from about 10 to the 11 to, depending on how much strain you can apply, um, you know, 10 to the 15th um, uh, dislocation density. Now, if we look into detail um, into the dislocations, there's actually, you can see two dislocation populations. You have your mobile dislocation population and you have your immobile dislocation population. And at the beginning, yes, the mobile dislocation density increases, yes, faster than the immobile, because you don't have mobile dislocations, immobile dislocations yet, right? And so, so, so uh, at low strains, we have more mobile dislocations than immobile dislocations, yes? But as we deform more and more, yes, most of the dislocations become immobile dislocations. Yeah? So at higher strains, yes, we have more Mobile, immobile dislocations or forest dislocations, then we have mobile dislocations. Okay. Right, and, and, and this, uh, this is why I thought maybe this was a little bit confusing because I, I, I think I stressed a little bit the fact that, you know, when you strain material, um, you'll, you'll have a lot more immobilized dislocations than, than mobile dislocations. That's true, but at very low uh, levels of uh, stress or then deformation, which is this case, right? This is for single crystals uh, at, and, and, and at uh, about a, a resolved shear stress of 20 megapascal, you, you're barely starting to de uh, uh, deform the material. Then, of course, your forest dislocation density is low, okay? That's what I meant here. So at the beginning, that's why I showed this and I, I uh, didn't quite... Um, remember why I had included that slide in the presentation. So just, just in case you, uh, it confused you that there were so low, the, the, the forest dislocation density was so low. In, um, let me see here if I have a, yeah. Yeah, and, and so, um, uh, right, and so what, what's nice about uh, this particular model of dislocation density is that uh, it shows very nicely, as we will see, that um, the strain hardening is basically, if, if you make the connection with the strain hardening that you observe with single crystals, where you have three stages, the easy glide, then stage two with uh, a very high uh, rate of strain hardening, uh, that it's what, when you do deform a steel, you're actually looking at strain th uh, stage three strain hardening, hmm? where the strain hardening as a function of the stress is a linear function, decreasing linear function. Hmm? Okay. So, and we'll show that uh, 
with this model, we can get stress strain curves that nicely mimic uh, experimentally measured uh, data, hmm? where you have a shear stress as a function of shear strain, or uh, you can change this shear stress, shear strain into uh, tensile stress, tensile uh, strains, and you will have an initially high uh, rate, uh, uh, strain rate, which will gradually go to zero at a saturation, uh, sorry, uh, at, at, a, uh, um, at, at a saturation stress, yes, a saturation stress. So this is, this is the equation, simple equation that you get between the strain hardening and the, and the stress in, in practice. Hmm? All right. So, and, uh, now, in reality, yeah, as I said, the mobile dislocation density and the immobile dislocation density are two separate populations, yes? However, yes, in what will follow, yes, we assume that that most, this is when you strain the material, uh, and by the way, this is a log scale, yeah? yeah? So if I put this in a linear scale, if I make a linear scale, yeah? It basically looks like this. The mobile dislocation density and the immobile, di so it's only at the very beginning, yes, that my mobile dislocation density is higher, yes? So, in the following, we assume what's written on the first line here is that the, um, the total dislocation density is what we will be computing, yes? And the total density is the, the sum of mobile dislocation density plus immobile dislocation density. And because the experiments show us this, yes, we will just say, when we compute the dislocation density, what we're actually computing is the immobile dislocation density. And we don't really need to worry too much about the immobile dislocation density because it's so small and it stays small. Yes? Okay? Right. And so, 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 the, the, so the idea now is um, we will... Uh, we don't need to, to, to separate mobile dislocation from immobile dislocation. We can just talk about dislocation density. That's point number one. That's an important point here, right? Um, the second point is, okay, so how do we compute this dislocation density? Well, it's, again, it's simple. We say um, these sources here, these Frank Reed sources that come from uh, double cross-slip processes, yes, they generate dislocations. Yeah, the, I stress, many dislocations are generated. So, um, I generate dislocation. I have a process of dislocation generation, right? Yeah. Okay, then these dislocations, these dislocations run into each other, yes, and they will form Somehow, uh, we, d we don't need to go into details, actually. Um, they form forest dislocations. They're just stuck there. Yeah? So there is a transition from, immobile, uh, from mobile dislocation to immobile dislocation. Actually, it's, it's the sources that produce the mo immobile dislocations. Yes? So we will assume also that the, r the rate at which we produce Yes, mobile dislocations is equal to the rate at which we store dislocations. Yes, and we will assume that the mobile dislocation density just stays flat, doesn't change. Hmm? Okay. All right. So then, um, um, so that means dislocation density increases, increases, increases. So you would have a, a strange situation that the strain hardening would increase all the time, 
but it doesn't. We, we know that the strain hardening goes like this, yes? Uh, um, we, um, uh, it goes like this, goes to zero, right? There is no increase anymore. So that means that something must happen to the dislocations, right? Something must be taking them away, yes? And, and that, that mechanism, those mechanisms are called annihilation. Annihilation. So we also have a competing process of annihilation, and, and those are dislocation, dislocation interactions, yes, whereby dislocation actually uh, uh, annihilate each other. For instance, I, as I showed you, if I have a positive edge dislocation, that means meets a negative edge dislocation, bloop, the dislocation is gone. Yeah? Or I have two dislocations, yes that react together to form a third dislocation. Again, the dislocation length is, uh, dislocation density is decreased, okay? Um, uh, they, they don't have to be uh, this close to each other or this perfect to, to give this uh, annihilation, certainly not in uh, ferritic steels where the, uh, uh, the, the uh, where cross-slip processes are very uh, um, simple, okay? So, so, the, so, so uh, let me get the pen here. So, so the, the total the evolution of dislocation density is a result of dislocation multiplication or storage. Uh, I, I kind of use these words uh, together or mix them. So when I say multiplication, it also means storage. Um, uh, and dislocation annihilation. You know? So you write this, this, the change of dislocation density is uh, there is a term that increases and there's a term that causes decrease, okay? Um, and of course, increase of dislocation is accumulation of immobile dislocations uh, caused by the arrest of these dislocations at strong obstacles, hmm, which they cannot cut. And, and you know, a lot of forest dislocations, for instance, will do that to a glide dislocation, okay? Right, so let's have a look here. So, Right, so how do we describe the dislocation uh, multiplication rate? Okay, well, it may uh, seem strange, but the, uh, the, the parameter that we'll use is called the mean-free path, the mean dislocation mean-free path. Right? And uh, basically uh, what the name says, it's uh, the, the distance a dislocation will move from the source to the place where it's immobilized. Hmm? So this dislocation here, for instance, yeah, uh, is, uh, is created, it moves, it moves, and here it meets um, very strong uh, obstacles formed by forest dislocation, and it stops. So that distance, uh, from, it has moved from here to here freely, yes, and so I call that distance, I call that lambda, and I say that's, that's the um, a mean uh, free path of the dislocations. Yeah? And so that approach is, is actually been uh, is, uh, very elegant because it allows you to put in lots of effects into this model. Yes? Not only the effect of dislocation, just, just strain hardening, the effect of dislocation density. Okay? So this mean free path is nothing else than uh, some kind of distance between dislocation source and the obstacle to the motion of the dislocation. Hmm? And so, and, and now what's important also is the increment of immobile dislocation is proportional to the displacement of these dislocations. So I generate a number of dislocations per unit time. They cross, they get, they get immobilized. So I increase the amount of immobile dislocations, yes? Um, the rate at which I create, I store these dislocations has to do with this distance. Uh, the, the longer I take, the, the longer this distance is, the more dislocations I can generate before they get, yes? Hmm? All right. So, so, so the, the increment, yes, is proportional to this displacement. Yeah? The, the further they are apart, the more dislocations I can generate, yes? So I, the, the loop makes 10 dislocations per second, yeah? 
it, it, if it takes 10 seconds to move, I'll, I'll make 10 immobile dislocations per second. If they move 20, yes, I, I can get more dislocations um, uh, pumped into the uh, uh, obstacle. Hmm? Right, so the increment uh, we call the, uh, D rho, hmm? yes, and uh, is equal to rho m, hmm? the mobile dislocation density, when the mobile dislocation density has traveled a distance lambda. Hmm? So I, I make a certain density, yes, it takes, they, they, they move one after the other, yes, hmm? when, when the when they have moved a distance equal to the uh, uh, mean free path, the amount of mobile dis immobile dislocation has increased by the number of dislocations that was originally created at the source. Hmm? And we assume, yes, that the density of mobile dislocation always stays the same. So you always have the same amount of mobile dislocation that is fed into the dislocation obstacle. So, right, so, so originally I have a dislocation density rho immobilized here, yes. The source makes rho m uh, mobile dislocations. They travel for a distance uh, lambda, yes. And when they've all traveled a distance lambda, they all become part of this immobile dislocation density, yes? If they only travel a fraction of this distance, yes, the increase will be a fraction of the total amount, right? Okay, so, so I can express this simply mathematically by saying, so the increase in dislocation density is the increase in immobile dislocation density is rho m, yes, mobile dislocation, times dx, the distance they travel, divided by lambda, the mean uh, free path. So say dx is lambda, right? Then uh, the increase is equal to the mobile dislocation density, all right? So the dislocations, so the, the way you understand this is the dislocation source creates rho m mobile dislocations, hmm? and they become immobile dislocations at the obstacles. Hmm? So, and of course it depends on where, you know, how, uh, how they are within this distance. Hmm? And that's this dx, all right? Okay, the other direction, all right. Okay, now, now so why are we interested in, in having this dx, this distance they move? But of course, because that's, this dx is related to strain, the macroscopic strain, okay? Okay, so, so again, uh, so th this increase is equal to rho m when dx is lambda. Hmm? And, and of course, and again, remember the, the rate at which I, I generate mobile dislocation is constant. So now let's connect this, this production of dislocation to the shear strain, yes? Because as I make dislocations, yes? As I make dislocations, I will generate strain, yes? Okay, so, right, so let, now we, we'll, we'll, we'll have a, a situ just to, uh, this is a formula we've already seen, by the way, right? So, so if I have, um, dislocations here, number of dislo edge dislocations, which move a distance dx, yes? What is the shear that they, they will make here, right? Okay, well, the density of dislocation, so first the number of dislocations I have here, times their Burgers factor, times the density, excuse me, times the, the distance that they have traveled. Yeah? So if they all travel dx, yes, I will get this amount of shear. Hmm? So our density change was given by the equation I've just written up here. Yes? And the shear yes, that 
the motion of these dislocations, these mobile dislocations over a distance dx gives me is d gamma rho, so, so here, rho mobile dislocation, mal b times b times dx, all right? So if I combine these two equations, I can now have d rho d gamma, the change of the immobile dislocation density with strain, yes? So basically the, the change of the, the storage of dislocations with deformation. Um, so I, I just make a, a, the ratio of these two parameters and I find one over lambda times b. So it's only dependent on the mean free path and the Burgess vector, obviously, right? Okay, so that's really interesting because it means that if I can, if, if I have a way to determine the mean free path in this model, I, you know, I can basically get to uh, the change, the storage term in the dislocation density evolution. Okay, right. So uh, how how will this look like? Well, we we do uh, this is how we uh, uh, determine. Uh, this lambda, or 1 over lambda, if you want. So the dislocations, uh, 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 mean free distance is obviously a key parameter, right? And so how are we going to uh, determine it? Um, so it's not a constant, first of all, obviously. You, um, you can see it's not going to be a constant because it will be smaller as the dislocation density increases, right? The more dislocations I have, the closer they are. Yeah? Um, so that's one thing. So um, omega, oh sorry, lambda, the mean free path, is connected to the dislocation density. Mm -hmm. The other thing is it's connected to dislocation density, but also connected to the interaction with the obstacles. Yes? So in general, the dislocations will not stop at the first obstacle, right? Uh, if a dislocation, dislocations are not that wimpy that they stop at the first obstacle. They can cut through a few obstacles before they get stopped. So to take into account the fact that not every, um, not the first time a dislocation meets an obstacle, a forest dislocation, it will stop, we introduce a factor k. This k parameter is introduced. Physical meaning of it is simply to say, well, that's the number of obstacle a dislocation will need to encounter before it's immobilized. And it takes, yeah, and, and, yeah, yeah. So, so lambda yeah, is equal to the distance that we have between uh, dislocations, and that's, we know that's proportional to 1 over the square root of the dislocation density. And that's, that's actually exact, you know, if we have a square array of edge dislocations, as I've, I've shown many times. But it holds in, the, in general terms also. And then we have this k factor, numerical factor, which takes into account, you know, this, this, uh, the fact that dislocations don't stop at the first um, uh, forest dislocation that they meet. So we can rewrite this. The rate of storage of dislocations is proportional to the current dislocation density divided by two numerical parameters, k and b. All right, good, so that's perfect. So, so now we've got the, um, to take into um, consideration these annihilation terms, yes? So what, what we say here is, well, you know, um, we'll, we'll think of dislocations as uh, not as lines, but as like flexible cylinders, yes, with a certain 
radius r. Yes, a certain radius r. Yes, and then um, so they're flexible tubes like this. Yes, and um, they can meet other flexible tubes. Yes, like this, right? Of radius r. Yes, and um, if the dislocations are within this distance r from each other, they can interact. They can annihilate or they can give junctions, right? Okay, and, and so uh, we present this as follows. Hmm? So the dislocation uh, generation, so the term uh, I just uh, showed, which I have to, uh, but many people do this, so you say generation, storage, and accumulation, that's kind of always the same, yes? The reason is because the, the, the dislocation you generate are stored, yes? Uh, so that's, that's the term here, the dislocation storage. This, this is the same as storage yeah? term. Let me just make sure there's no confusion with, because I, I know this may sometimes, certainly if it's the first time you hear about these concepts, uh, this may be, so this is the storage term. Yes, and... Oh, okay, and this, so this is balanced by spontaneous annihilation of dislocations. When two dislocations, for instance, of opposite sign meet under favorable conditions. Yeah? And um, this process has a name. We call it dynamic recovery. Yes? It's basically you are uh, deforming material, yes? and uh, the process of deformation itself yes. Uh, results in a reduction of the dislocations, and that's because dislocations interact. Hmm? Dynamic re uh, recovery. Um, so the number of recovery sites on a slip plane is, of course, very simple, proportional to dislocation density. What else? Because we're talking about dislocation, dislocation interactions, right? So it's, yeah. Uh, but not all sites result in annihilation, yes? And of course, the dislocations can only interact if they are within a certain distance from each other, right? So, so we need to have a term that kind of takes these things into account. So we look at the uh, very general idea. You have a, a dislocation segment of length L. It moves with a certain velocity dx dt. And this can capture or annihilate other dislocations of opposite Burgess vector if these are within a radius r of the dislocation core, right? So not necessarily on the same glide plane, etc. And for iron, BCC iron is actually very realistic because we know the dislocations, even if they're there and there, they can cross slip. Yes, they can cross slip and, and react if you know, it's possible. So the moving dislocation will sweep a certain volume V, you know, which is equal to uh, 2DRL times DX in a time interval of DT. So now let's have a look. Uh, right, and then we introduce beta. Hmm? Uh, the fraction of this location which actually be annihilated. Yeah? Wh wh why do we need to in introduce this beta? Well, um, this a dislocation like this can annihilate this dislocation if they are within a distance r from each other, right? However, uh, If this is this dislocation, yes, there's go not going to be annihilation, right? So not all dislocation, dislocation uh, meetings, as it were, lead to annihilation. So that's why I, I introduced this factor beta, hmm, which tells me that only a limited number of uh, interactions will lead to annihilations. Hmm. 
Um, and then the amount of dislocations which is annihilated per unit length of moving dislocation is given by beta. So, so uh, by, by this, yeah. And the annihilation rate is therefore given by this here. It's basically uh, the same thing. Hmm? Multiplied with the mobile dislocation density because this is for per unit length of moving dislocation. Right? So if I, I have to multiply, this is for one dislocation and a unit length of it. So if I multiply this times the mobile dislocation density, yes, I get the, the annihilation rate. Okay? Right, so now I have the annihilation rate is proportional to the dislocation density. Okay, and now I do the same, uh, I, I use the same equation for dx relation between dx and the shear strain. You remember that the shear strain was equal to dislocation density mobile times b times dx, yes? Right, and so this gives me dx is d gamma divided by rho m times b, okay? So this gives me a formula for the rate of annihilation, the rate of annihilation, yes? Two b times rho, uh, the dislocation density times r divided by b. So it is proportional to the dislocation density. The, uh, so I have a storage term, which is proportional to square root, and I have an annihilation term, which is proportional to the dislocation density. So let's have a look at what we have found now. We, so if we combine these two equations, so the, these two parameters that we have now, the dislocation, we find a, a fundamental equation for strain hardening. Yeah? Right, so that's really important. It says that the dislocation density with, with shear strain uh, consists of two terms, a storage term and an annihilation term, and the storage term is proportional to the square root of the dislocation density, and the annihilation term is proportional to the uh, density of dislocations. Hmm? And what is interesting here is that is to look at what is the implication of this um, for um, strain hardening. Yeah? Um, and we can look at this by first saying, well, if we look at this equation, there, it seems to be that there is a condition yes, of saturation. Yes? There is a saturation dislocation. You can see that D uh, uh, rho d divided by d gamma, so the rate of generation of this location can become zero. Yes? And, and of course can become zero if these two terms are equal to each other, right? So we have a saturation dislocation generation which is given by this. For beta square times k square times r square Yes, which are in fact these parameters of our model. Yeah? But there is a saturation dislocation density. Okay. Right, so now, uh, why, why is this so important, this equation? Because now that I have this equation, it gives me the evolution of the dislocation density with strain. Yes? as a function of the current value of the dislocation density. Okay, and if I can combine this with this relation, which gives the relation between the shear stress and the square root of the dislocation density, I have basically a stress-strain relation. Yes, because 
if I numerically integrate, if I numerically integrate this, yeah, I obtain the dislocation density as a function of shear strain. And if I take the square root of this at every value of the strain, I get my shear stress, shear strain equation. Good. But let's now have um, first perhaps a look at the strain hardening. Yeah? Uh, and I can do this, I, I don't need to uh, numerically integrate this because I actually need this formula. So if I look at the strain hardening, that's d tau d gamma, hmm? expressed in terms of uh, shear stress, shear strains. Yeah? So that is, um, so I, I, you, you do the derivative of this equation, it's very simple, alpha g b uh, times one half and then one uh, rho gamma to the minus one half d gamma, d rho d gamma. Hmm? And d rho d gamma is here. You have it. So I, you can just input this here. Okay. So this basically gives me the strain hardening, yes, as a function of the uh, dislocation density. Yeah? So we can rewrite this, this last equation. Yeah? We can now rewrite this as, so I, I, I bring out so this factor here, this factor here I will call theta zero. Yeah? And of course if I look carefully here I have alpha g b square root of, of gamma. So, uh, so I have uh, here, I have a factor, yes, which includes the shear strain, shear stress, excuse me. So I can um, rewrite this like this. Theta zero, one minus the shear stress divided by a shear stress, the saturation shear stress. And in this very simple equation, theta zero is the initial strain hardening, which is alpha times g divided by two times k, and T saturation is the saturation stress. Yes, I call this saturation. So I can plot this strain hardening as a function of the shear stress, and it's, a, it's, it's basically a line, a straight line, that goes from theta zero to um, uh, tau saturation. Yes, and that's exactly, if I go back a few slides here, from last time we, uh, yes, it's exactly the relationship that we have here, yes, that I had uh, predicted for uh, polycrystalline uh, steel. Hmm? All right, so that's, that's a nice result to have. Okay. All right. Okay. So, again, um, we are now um, ready to, to, to see if we can use this equation, because it would be really neat if we could use this equation. Uh, and, um, and let's try to use it for, for steel, yes? Um, obviously, the way I presented it here, we can only use it for a single phased steel. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I could use it for a you know, ferritic steel with very low carbon ferritic steel, but I could principle use it for a martensite also because martensite is basically ferrite. Uh, with a number of uh, microstructural features. One of the microstructural features that I haven't talked about here, yes, and you feel that maybe it does, it should have an effect, and that's the grain size, right? Obviously, if I want to use this equation for steel and, 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 and get a reasonable uh, prediction, a model prediction, I will need to say, to take into account grain sizes. And the reason is because steels have 
relatively small grain sizes. So the, the, there is an effect, actually important effect, from the grain size. So how do we take this into account? Well, this is a nice example of where this approach uh, works very well. It's actually very simple to put in the, uh, the effect of, the, of a grain size or anything else microstructural feature that works as a obstacle to dislocation glide. So we can take the grain size into account by saying, well, they're rigid obstacles. Yeah? They're rigid obstacles. When a dislocation hits a, a grain boundary, it's finished. It just cannot go on anymore. So it, it just gets stored. And uh, yeah. It's, so it's not like a meeting a, um, a forest dislocations where I may, the dislocation may be able to cut through quite a few of them before it actually stops. So um, we can, um, uh, in the presence of grain boundaries, we can um, uh, expand the definition of our mean free path, yes, taking into account the dislocation grain size. So instead of using uh, so, uh, the, so the, the, the storage term for the dislocation density, d rho d gamma plus equal to 1 over lambda times b. Yes. In the case of only dislocation-dislocation interactions, this is what we had. Dislocation density square divided by k. If I have an additional obstacle, I just add it, 1 over d plus, yes? It's very simple. You can understand why I can just, um, you can maybe not uh, directly um, feel that I can just make the sum of these two, but let's just imagine uh, uh, two uh, simple cases, yes? Uh, say I have huge grains, I mean humongous grains, millimeter size, yes? Right, so D is very, very large, yeah? And uh, I'm deforming this and, you know, I have lots of dislocations here and then glide dislocations that get tangled, uh, yeah? And, um, and here is a dislocation source and this is my... Um, uh, the, the mean distance yes, between the dislocations, 1 over. Yeah. So in this case, this factor will become what? Yes. 1 over d will be very, very small. Yes. And this equation will refer to square root d divided by k. Yes. Because, uh, because these forest dislocation will be the, the main obstacle. Yeah? Right. Now, let's, let's do a very different situation. Let's do very different. We have very tiny grains. Yeah? So D is very, very small. Then it becomes very difficult to actually generate dislocations. Yeah? And you, you remember, it had, it had to do with, you know, when you have a Frank Reed source, the smaller, and say we, um, you use this picture of uh, the, the double cross slip here, and, and so this is the, the distance between the pinning points. If this distance is very small, yes, it becomes very hard to produce a dislocation, yes? Because there is a one over R relationship. So if I make a crystal very, very small, necessarily the pinning points will be closer to each other, yes? So, um, right. Um, so in the end, yes, the term 1 over d is much, much larger than this term because I have a low dislocation density, yeah? Low dislo so in this case, dislocation density is very, very low. So this term is low, this term is very high, yes, and obviously uh, the mean free path will be 
the size of the grain at best. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so I, I, I hope this makes this uh, acceptable. So now we can, uh, you know, uh, get our uh, equation uh, becomes like this: yeah? one over d plus square root rho over k. Yeah? We can numerically integrate this. I'll try to, again, I promised you already two things that I would put on E-class. I'll, I'll put it on E-class how you can, you know, if you don't know how to numerically integrate an equation like this, I'll show you. It's very simple. I'll, I'll put it on uh, E-class. Uh, and um, so you numerically, so that gives you this function, uh, rho as a function of gamma, yes? And, and that gives you the shear stress. Shear stress as a function of shear strain is this. That's the strain hardening. It's very, actually rather simple. Hmm? Okay, so let's see, uh, can we use this? Yes, uh, yeah, and actually, yes, we can use this. Um, and um, we can make, uh, for a single phase situation, we can actually, um, um, what shall I say, uh, simplify things um, and by just, just by noting that we ha in, in practice, we often have situation like this, where the mobile dislocation density stays the same. Right? So what does this mean? If the, the mobile dislocation density doesn't change, Yes, mm. or um, yeah. I can simp actually simplify the first term. Mm. I can the first term here. I can change it into so. Uh, this is the equation we d derived. Yes, we so basically uh, I, I, I can rewrite it as k one. This, this being a constant, and then minus k2 times the dislocation density. And, and so in this case, k2 is um, you know, t t 2 beta times r, r divided by, by b, yes? And, and but what I'm saying in, in, um, in uh, addition is that this term here, yes, is a constant. Hmm? So the dislocation storage rate is considered constant. It's, it, and it basically means I'm not changing the rate at which I produce mobile dislocations, yes? And I, I can do this because uh, my uh, uh, um, mobile dislocation and is low and, and pretty much flat, yes? Right, now if that's the case, um, we can actually uh, integrate this equation directly. Hmm? So uh, one of the things I do first, yes, is I, I'm, I'm going to get rid of the shear st strain, yes? And you know I can do this by using Taylor's factor, Taylor factor. Epsilon is gamma divided by m, all right? And so I obtain very simply uh, something that I, can in, that I can integrate directly, d rho over m times k1 minus k2 times dislocation density is d epsilon, right? So now if I integrate this, it will give me an equation of the dislocation density as a function of the tensile strain. So inte I integrate this equation, yeah, and I get the dislocation density strain dependence. It's basically, uh, uh, you can look at it um, after class, but it's, it's basically a straightforward uh, integration here. And I, I've, I've written down the steps. If you, um, so the dislocation density with strain is equal to this. So first term k1 over k2 times 1 minus e minus k2m times epsilon plus rho 0 times e minus k2m times
times epsilon. And here, k1 and k2 are these uh, parameters here. m is the Taylor factor. Rho zero is the initial dislocation density. And, uh, yeah, and, and epsilon is, of course, the strain. Okay? Right. So let's now have a look at uh, how we then calculate the strain hardening. The strain hardening is, oops, um, yes, okay, yes, it's, um, the, so the, the strain hardening, the stress, shear stress as a function of shear strain equation is known, is shown here, alpha b g times b times the square root of dislocation density. I can get the shear from the shear stress to the tensile stress by multiplying this with m, with the Taylor factor, okay? And I can get the change of the dislocation density with the uh, uh, strain from here. And so this is a rho as a function of tensile uh, strain. So I get tensile stress as a function of tensile strain. And that's basically a stress strain curve. Yes? Um, of course, if I want to have a, a real stress strain curve, I need to add other strengthening parameters, such as the pyrrole stress, the lattice friction, and the solid solution effect, and all the other effects we still have to discuss. But let's just say we have these two terms. Yeah? So let's have an example of how this works. Well, first of all, we'll need the Burgess factor in this equation. That's, that's here. Uh, point 248 times nanometers, the orientation factor, uh, the um, uh, Taylor factor is about three. The shear modulus, uh, 80 something, 84 gigapascal here. This parameter alpha here is 0.35. Hmm? Okay. And then we will use this equation to do two things. We'll uh, make a, a, a stress strain curve for the um, uh, for ferrite, single phase ferrite, and for martensite. And so the big difference here when we do this is that for the ferrite grain size, yes, we basically have a equivalent um, distance, uh, mean free path for dislocations which is equal to the grain size. And say, we, we take here a grain size of 35 microns. Okay, it's pr pretty large grain size. Okay, but for a, um, but not an unreasonable for a very well annealed uh, uh, IF steel, for instance. Martensite, however, the, we have to, there is no grain size in martensite, we have to take the lat size into account. And that's much smaller, that's much smaller, yes, that is of the order of 100 to 200 nanometers. Yeah? So, so for the example I'll, I'll, I'll show, or, and that you can recalculate if you want, is 120 uh, nanometers in this case, okay? All right, good. So, um, so what we do here, remember, what was K1? Hmm? K, K1 is this, this term here. Hmm? And this, this comes from this term. Right? Okay. And this term, we go back a little bit here. Here it is. That's the term. Right? 1 over D plus square root rho over K. Okay. So that's the equation I'm using here. So. K is equal to 1 over B times lambda, and uh, lambda can be 1 over the square root of dislocation density, or the, the grains, subgrain, or lat size, yes, depending on the situation. In this case, yes, we know that we can use grain size, yes, because we have a very low uh, 
increase in the rate, yeah, uh, production, increase in the amount of mobile dislocations. There, basically, there's no increase yes, with strength. So, so, so um, the term that's important here will be 1 over d, yes? 1 over the grain size. So this, the K1 in, in, in this particular example is, uh, uh, is equal to, to hmm, 1 over lambda d. Hmm? Uh, sorry, 1 over d times p. Hmm? So I... So this is the general form, yes, and so, yeah, so this is the mean free path equation, yes, and so in this case, uh, lambda is d, so this, this will be k1, all right, in this particular case. Okay, so let me go back here, lattice friction. 55, um, right, so for this particular example, I, sh I chose 55, um, so that is, um, yes. Then, uh, annihilation parameters for ferrite and annihilation parameter for martensite, I give you values, okay? Uh, you can uh, calculate them uh, based on what we know for uh, capital K, and beta, yes. Uh, these values are determined on the basis of uh, experiments. Experiments, they're good values, yes, uh, that many people have found, so we'll use those. Initial dislocation densities in ferrite is very low, yeah. Initial dislocation densities in martensite are very high, right. Remember, uh, when we uh, deform well annealed uh, ferrite, the initially we have very few dislocations. In martensite, you have plenty of transformation dislocations. And then the solute solution strengthening, we also need to take into account. And there, uh, you know, I can use theories or I can use an empirical approach. This is the one we've chosen. And these are the solid solution strengthening effects I've taken into account. And, uh, and this, this is what you get. This is what you get. So a, a stress strain curve for ferrite, stress strain curve for martensite, yes. Uh, and you can see that um, the, uh, the stress strain curves look very realistic, yes. And, uh, and they basically um, very well uh, model um, single phase uh, steels in, in this uh, simple, using this simple analytical form of the equation. Yeah? All right, so the nice thing uh, you can see, uh, even in this uh, relatively simple case, that although you have many parameters, I agree, uh, most of these parameters you cannot freely choose. Yeah? The Taylor factor is what it is. The Burgess factor you cannot touch. You know, obviously, it's, so, it's, it's not really a fitting parameter. Right? So many of these uh, numbers are not fitting parameters in, you know, because they're, they're what they are physically for steel. But, you can, but th there are parameters you can play with. Yeah? You know you can change the grain size. Yeah? You can know you can change the composition. Yes? Hmm? You know you can change the initial dislocation density. That's fine. You can do this. And then, of course, you can see directly what the impact will be of what you do on the stress strain curve. Yes? So it's very handy um, theory to um, predict not only the, the, the strength of the material, but also the flow strength at different strains. Yes? Okay. And there are ways to expand this theory, and it's been done, uh, you know, to multi-phase steels or, or to uh, 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 steels with more complex uh, strain hardening or additional strain hardening mechanisms. Okay. All right. I'm, I'm a little bit over time, so sorry about that. 
Uh, thank you for your attention. I hope everybody got the email that we have makeup lecture time on Friday from 4 to 6. So this two, two lectures are being made up for next week because I'm going to be absent on Tuesday and I will not be able to get back here in time to teach on Thursday. So we'll do two classes, all right? And then we'll have, and, I, I, that's, uh, and then we'll have a, a quiz on the week after that, yes, on, on, the, on our regular quiz Thursday. Um, yes, we'll have, and, and that will cover the whole block of lectures, okay? So there'll be more questions, okay? It's a little bit uh, more stressful. <laughs> and on, um, so, so on uh, Friday, so tomorrow afternoon, we will be um, uh, talking about grain size strengthening in steels. <laughs>